I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about a functional approach to gynecology. So literally, this is the first place that we start with our gynecologist. We've, we got some basic tests done and then we're referred to the fertility clinic. But what if your gynecologist took a functional approach to your fertility and really looked at everything that was going on in your body, your mind, body, and spirit, instead of just referring you off to the fertility clinic. So this is an awesome conversation really with a forward thinking practitioner and excited for you to get some information out of this with regards to you know what you could be missing before you go to the fertility clinic and excited for you to listen. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take the few minutes right now, you can pause this this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. Hey there. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the supercharger fertility discovery call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time falling asleep, waking up at night, or feeling tired when we wake up, sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. And melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. There's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent uh, frame and they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer nanometer range. So this is exact range has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. So I got to say I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day and I have to say after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription and reading glasses. Plus you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Use the coupon code Get Pregnant Podcast at checkout and receive a 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get Pregnant Podcast to receive your 15% discount. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows 
that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, the founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Dr. Tabitha Barber to the podcast and we're digging into what you wish your gynecologist would have told you about your fertility. Dr. Tabitha Barber has devoted her life to giving women a voice and a choice when it comes to their health and well-being. As a young girl, she struggled with self-esteem and identity issues, dealt with peer pressure and survived the ridicule and stigma of becoming a teenage mother. As she shared in her first published book titled From White Trash to White Coat, The Birth of Catherine's Purpose, those events led Tabitha to finding her purpose in life. Perseverance and grace, she was able to redirect her path in life and become a successful physician. Dr. Tabitha is double board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. She's a certified menopause practitioner. She's also completed training at the Cleveland Clinic's Institute for Functional Medicine and the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. She cares for women one-to-one -one in her clinic as a functional gynecologist and is the creator and host of the Functional Gynecologist podcast. So thanks so much for listening. I'm so thankful that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Dr. Tabitha, excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so can you share your journey of really how you came to do this work? I was just sharing with you beforehand when I read your bio, it was just so, so inspiring. It like brought a tear to my eye. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love for you to to, to share your journey as to how you, how you came here. Oh, well, thank you. I, it was a long, crazy journey. You know, I was kind of a rebel child. I didn't listen to authority. I did what I wanted. Uh, I didn't really have any interest in school. I just wanted to socialize and have fun. I got into the wrong crowds and I made the wrong choices. And I ended up getting pregnant in high school in 11th grade. And I had to drop out after that to stay home and take care of her. So I didn't go my senior year. I'd really never thought about my future because I was always living in the present moment. I was just a very spontaneous, fun person. And that was a big reality check. And what was a bigger reality check was how I was treated as a pregnant woman, or I guess I was still a child myself, but I was on Medicaid and food stamps. And I was definitely treated differently. I was talked down to. I wasn't, you know, nothing was explained to me. I wasn't given options. I had no voice, no choice in the matter. Things just happened to me. And I had a really traumatic labor and delivery experience that scarred me. Mm -hmm. And I came out of that with open eyes, like, oh my gosh, there's probably more girls in the world who are treated the way I have been treated. And it's not cool. It's not okay. Somebody needs to stand up for us. And that's when I started thinking about how could I be a voice for women like myself and help them through those times. And I realized oh, I need to be a doctor. I need to take care of women and talk to them and do have conversations with them and give them a choice in their health care and help them understand things and respect them. And so that led me down this long, painful journey to finding my purpose of taking care of women. And I've just committed my life to it. So I went back, I got my GED, I went to a community college and I kicked butt for two years and got a 4.0. And then I got scholarships and I transferred to Michigan State University. And that led to the long, arduous path of becoming a physician. It was definitely one of the most grueling and painful 
things I've ever done. I don't regret it for a minute, but it was not healthy for my own self, mentally or physically. It destroyed me. And I lasted about 10 years after residency being an obstetrician and gynecologist, but I got to the point where it broke me down and I could no longer function. I actually had a back injury. I had to do the unthinkable and take four months off of practice, have back surgery, Mm. which didn't help. And I had to figure out how to heal myself. So I found the world of functional medicine and I healed myself after conventional medicine failed me. And that was another eye-opening moment. Like, wow, there's so many tools in the world that I could use to help heal my patients. And I didn't know anything about them. And so now I've been on another journey to just gain as much knowledge that I can and just really embrace the world of wellness as opposed to the sick care that I was doing before. Now I take care of women with conventional medicine and functional medicine. Yeah, I love that. And it is interesting where we sometimes have to have our own dark night of the soul kind of thing where we all, you know, and then we're like, wait a minute, we discover this functional side of things and then you can never look back. And it sounds like that's kind of a similar to you and yours. Yeah, definitely. As you're saying through going through medical school, very grueling and brutal. And, and then yeah, years later, discovering the functional side of things, which I think is to me very empowering the functional side of things. Yeah, exactly. And so today, let's I just want to take some general questions kind of around a functional approach to to gynecology. So that's what you do. So, but first of all, I wanted to start off with some of the conventional testing for fertility. And if you could talk about some of the basics, if, if someone comes to you and they've, you know, trying for a year and they're under 35 or, or over 35 in uh, less than six months. Sure. Yeah. I was trained, you know, as a conventional OBGYN that there's a differentiator between women who are less than 35 and those who are over 35 because your ovarian reserve starts to go down. So the definition of infertility was you've been trying to get pregnant for a year if you're less than 35 and you've been unsuccessful or less or six months if you're over 35. So that would give us the green light to go ahead and start investigating. And it was traditionally like you're going to think of possible factors of the uterus, the ovaries, the hormones, um, and the pelvis. So that it was very much geared toward you know, your gynecological issues. There wasn't a lot of thought or concern regarding any other systems or lifestyle or anything like that. So it's standard to do day cycle day three labs and then check a progesterone on cycle day 21. So on day three, we wanted to see what your FSH or your follicle stimulating hormone looked like. That's kind of the hormone coming out of your brain, talking to your ovaries and saying, hey, it's time to ovulate. And so you want that level to be low. That level is what gets high in menopause. And then you want your estrogen to be a good amount, but not too high because that indicates that maybe your follicles are maturing too quickly and not releasing an egg. So we do those. And then day 21, you want your progesterone up there, you know, three to five is a decent number. And you that would indicate that you ovulated and the leftover cyst is making progesterone to support a possible pregnancy. So we do those labs and then we usually start with a pelvic ultrasound where we look at the ovaries in the uterus to see is there anything obvious like cysts on the ovaries or fibroids in the uterus. Big one is you also want to make sure that you're doing a semen analysis Mm -hmm. on their partner because there's not a lot of reason to go on and get, do more advanced stuff with the woman if it's a male factor issue, which it very often is. Um, I will tell you that men are hesitant to do this quite often. I've had a lot of patients who go through the rigmarole of getting an HSG done, which is a hysterosalpingogram, which is a very uncomfortable x-ray test where they put a catheter in the uterus and shoot dye inside there and then take pictures to see what it looks like um, as far as are your fallopian tubes open? Are there anything 
growing inside of the cavity or doing surgery, a laparoscopy. And women will go through all these things before their partner finally does the semen analysis and we find out they're, they're the major issue. But diagnostic laparoscopy is pretty standard as well. That's where we take you to the operating room, put you to sleep, put a couple little incisions in your belly. And then we look inside and we see like, is there endometriosis growing on the outside of your uterus or ovaries, on your bowels, on your bladder, things like that. You can also inject dye into the fallopian tubes during that procedure called chromatubation, and that can see if your tubes are open. And oftentimes, I'll tell you, having done that procedure, women will have blocked fallopian tubes and that will open them. So oftentimes just doing that procedure is enough to help them get pregnant. But that's pretty much the basic workup. Yeah. And I think it's interesting when you say about the semen analysis, because yeah, women go through all these tests and then wait a minute, the male partner, I speak to many that haven't even had, like she's been through all this workup and he hasn't even done a, a sperm count or an, or an analysis, or maybe it's just a, a very basic sperm count, but not like the DNA fragmentation, you know, uh, motility, any more detail. And as you say, well, it used to be 60, 40%, 60% female factoring fertility, 40% male. Now it's more 50, 50. So it really key to get those really, those basic tests first. Exactly. And it's such an easy test. Like literally I give them a cup to take home to their partner. They masturbate and ejaculate into the cup. They bring it back into the lab within an hour, keeping it warm. And it doesn't have to be embarrassing. They can do it at home. It's not a big deal. You know, it's so much less than going through surgery or these invasive procedures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. And so what are you seeing or what sort of some tasks or questions do you wish that were asked during an appointment with your gynecologist for fertility? So I will say this is what I learned in functional medicine. It's all connected. So you need to ask about the patient's diet and lifestyle. How are their stress levels? You know, how are they functioning through the day? Are they sleeping? You know, these things impact your fertility. And if you are seeing a physician who's not addressing these issues, then you probably aren't, you're probably not going to get the success that you are looking for or less likely to. That's for sure. That's what I've seen. I've been so much more successful getting my patients pregnant now that we tackle their diet and decrease their inflammation and we manage their stress and get their cortisol levels down and we get their vitamin and nutrient status up to par and we get them sleeping. We manage their subclinical hypothyroidism or their autoimmune issues like all of that stuff will make you so much more successful. Absolutely. That that mind, body, spirit approach too. So looking at the physical stressors on the body and then the chronic stress, even dealing with an infertility diagnosis by itself is is stressful. Yeah. And then the spiritual piece where I see a lot of people, you know, you dig into the functional side of things with the lab testing and making all these changes with diet, but then maybe you just have an underlying belief that it'll, it'll never work. So the spiritual right. side of things too, digging into those, you know, your intuitive hits and spiritual nudges and things with the, you know, the universe, God, um, higher power, whatever it is for you, that's, yeah, equally as important um, with making it all some of the functional side of things. Yeah, I would say that it's super common, unfortunately, in conventional gynecology for miscarriages to be downplayed because they're so common that, you know, it's a typical scenario would be a patient calls the office and says, I missed my period. I think I'm pregnant. The physician orders, you know, HCG levels, progesterone levels. We watch them go up or down. They, and then she ends up having a miscarriage at five or six weeks. And she's either given medication to help pass it, let it go spontaneously, or scheduled for a DNC. That all takes place. And then we don't see them again until the next time they call pregnant. And in the meantime, they have all these you know, conversations going on in their head, believing that they did something wrong or they're never going to be able to get pregnant again, or why did this happen to me? And I really don't think that we sit down and talk to women enough about why this did happen and how she can intervene and take control of her health so that it hopefully doesn't happen again. And I think because those conversations are hard and we're not really trained to do that as physicians, 
And so we just don't have them. Mm -hmm. Especially with the miscarriage where they're waiting to have three. What's your your take on that? (laughs) Yep. So we're trained to not deal with it until it's after the third one. And then we do this huge workup and, you know, check for all kinds of zebras, all kinds of rare things instead Mm -hmm. of common things. And so my approach is let's talk about it after the first one. Maybe it was just a fluke for lack of a better term. I mean, a million and a half things need to go right for your pregnancy to occur and continue on. Like it is really a miracle, but there are certain things that you can do to optimize that. And to not discuss that after the first miscarriage is doing that patient a huge disservice. So often I realize that these women are just very busy, super stressed out. Then they're stressed out about trying to get pregnant. They're eating fast food. They're living on Mountain Dew and coffee and things like that. They're a little bit overweight. They have, you know, a polycystic ovarian syndrome or you know, their blood pressure starting to go up, you know, things are trending in the wrong direction and nobody's dealing with it because they don't have an outright diagnosis that needs a medication yet. And so those discussions just don't happen. So I love to step in and say, you know what, you're trending in the wrong direction. We need to optimize your health. That's your house that you're going to, you know, grow a baby in. Let's make that the best environment possible for that baby, number one, even exists, and number two, thrive, right? Yeah, absolutely. With the trending piece, with looking at, we're doing blood chemistry reviews, so looking at them through the functional reference ranges, so it flags it before it it goes to disease and we're, we're not diagnosing where we're educating, but yeah, that, that trending piece where, oh wait, you know, instead of waiting until you have it's pre-diabetes or diabetes, well, wait a minute, there's things, you know, if the blood sugar is going off, there's things, you know, things we can do right now. And if the weight or, or if you're, you're eating a, you know, fast food processed diet, there's things we can do to optimize your success. And a lot of times in the miscarriage side of things, waiting, waiting for the third miscarriage, like that is absolutely heartbreaking and like to go through when you could have said, okay, after the first one, here's some things that you can do. And typically in conventional, it's like, it'll be making just very basic things such as, you know, eliminate your, eliminate alcohol. Don't, don't do drugs, you know, reduce caffeine and maybe look at you're getting your BMI in the, the right range. Whereas in the functional side of things, there's a, there's a very targeted approach and, and that, you know, that, that, that you can take. So there's a lot of missed healing opportunities. I think conventional medicine is trying or they're mm-hmm. starting to see a glimmer of things, you know, when Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility Society came out and said, hey, maybe if we optimize thyroid function, women tend to get pregnant more often. And so then they started looking at that more closely. And I, you know, of course, it's because they have a medication that they can give to treat it. So it's an easy fix. But it did give me hope that they are starting to realize that all of our systems are interconnected. And if your thyroid's not functioning well, your fertility's not going to function well, right? Absolutely. We see that all the time. Either it's undiagnosed Hashi- I, I, you know, Hashimoto's or Graves or hypothyroidism or hy- hyperthyroidism. We see more hypothyroidism or then the subclinical where it's not even the thyroid. Like we see that typically Most clients we're working with a a thyroid that's not optimized. Are you, you're seeing the similar thing? Oh yeah. All the time. And so what do you, so this kind of goes into the next question there. So what do you think is regularly missed with someone who's struggling with infertility from a conventional standpoint? Well, I kind of alluded to it. So I think stress is the biggest key because we are all way over you know, stressed. We are go, go, go nonstop from morning until night, too much on our plate. We're not stopping to process everything. So we are making cortisol and adrenaline like all day long in ways that we're not supposed to. And every time we do that, we steal progesterone from our hormones. And so we get super imbalanced and that usually, you know, leads to infertility. So or it leads to miscarriage as well. So it, I think stress is the number one factor and the most ignored factor. In addition to that, I would say the nutrition and the sleep. 
because it all relates to inflammation in your body. Inflammation is the main reason you get endometriosis and fibroids and you're not ovulating, like so many issues with that. Yeah. And this distress thing, obviously like the physical stressors, but then the mental emotional, uh, mental emotional stressors too, with that infertility diagnosis and it impacting all aspects of your life. We see people with their cortisol, especially if they've been through, like most people are coming to me, they've come through either a failed, a failed IVF or IUI or multiple failed IUIs and and IBFs, like sometimes five or six, which is crazy. And, but then seeing cortisol, like completely burnt out, people are just, there's nothing left. They're so, right. yeah. Right. They, they come to me and they're like, it was supposed to all be perfect. I don't know why it didn't work because you're not addressing these other systems and they're all connected. They're all interacting together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. As you say, the, the getting the, the right nutrition and sleep is key. I talked to so many people. They're like, I've got insomnia or I wake up during the night or I wake up and I'm exhausted. Like your sleep is a huge red flag to wait a minute. Let's, let's dig deeper as to why it's off. And sometimes it's been off for years and years and years. Yeah. It could be your gut health. You could have major gut dysbiosis. You could be having too much bacteria in your gut producing toxins that are causing inflammation. We know that's directly related to endometriosis and infertility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what's your take on the, the business of, of IVF? Well, I think that it's probably overutilized because we're not addressing these other root cause issues. I don't think it would be as needed if more gynecologists were addressing the diet and lifestyle aspects. You know, there's a place for it. I, I agree with it. I get concerned because there are studies that show it increases your risk for ovarian cancer. And then the, all the ethical questions, right? Like, are you altering the embryos genetically, things like that. But I think that we probably don't need to do it as quickly and as often as we do, unfortunately. Yeah, because it was developed people that have issues with blocked tubes and now it's being used for, you know, every diagnosis, you know, that that unexplained infertility, which to me with the functional side of things unexplained and there's always an explanation, but like the industry in itself is it's got a little stat here where it's it's in the US, it's a twenty five billion dollar industry and it's predicted to grow to forty one billion by two thousand twenty six. Mm -hmm. In nineteen eighty five there was forty fertility clinics in the US. In two thousand fifteen there's four hundred and forty. So it like it is big business and I yeah. you know, I had both my kids with donor eggs. I got diagnosed with premature ovarian failure and I went right to the fertility clinic, didn't get a second opinion, went on a list for donor eggs, actually thought that other people that had to go through years of, you know, treatments were worse off than I was. And then, you know, years later, I have my own health crisis where, uh, you know, I became allergic to all these antibiotics and I had food sensitivities and gut infections and chronic stress. So it eventually kind of catches up with you. But yeah, like it is big business and people being pushed through those multiple rounds of IVF and keep doing it and keep doing it. Like, what's your take on with someone's doing it over and over again without laying that laying a proper foundation for it to even work. I just think it's heartbreaking. Yeah. I, I wish people would investigate and just take a step back. But, you know, we are told to trust the medical system, right? And they, they're supposed to have all the answers for us. And unfortunately, it's an answer, but it's not the root cause answer. It's just kind of a band-aid. And so, so many people get stuck in the system and don't realize there's another way. I will tell you, I didn't realize there was another way because being a physician in the system, I was so busy and so entrenched and exhausted that I wasn't researching and looking outside of what I had already learned and trained to do. Why would I? What I would why would I even consider that there would be something else if it hadn't already been that I hadn't been exposed to it, right? So the idea for patients to not trust their physicians and go out and look for other explanations, I don't blame them. I don't, I, but I want them to do that. That's, you know, why I started my podcast, The Functional Gynecologist, because I do want women to realize there is a whole nother world and it's getting to the root cause of your issues and there's another way. And it is okay to question your doctor and it is okay to do the research on your own and keep investigating and don't give up 
up and don't just settle. Um, but I think it's scary for people. Absolutely. Especially when you have a trained person, you know, a smart person saying, oh, this is the only way you can do it. Or, you know, it'll never work for you doing it this way. Or you have, you have a very low percent chance of it working. And that, you know, well-meaning and advice, or maybe not well-meaning, you know, this is what they're trained in. They're not, they don't, if a physician is not trained in a functional approach, they don't know how powerful, you know, diet and lifestyle changes are. But that gets embedded in someone's consciousness and they can't even shake it because it's like, wait a minute, this 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 person over here told me it's not going to work. Exactly. I mean, I have cancer patients whose oncologists tell them it does not matter what you eat. Yeah. It does not matter what your vitamin D level is. And it just makes me sad, you know? And so I'm like, okay, well, we got to keep educating people. Mm -hmm. We have to get people's eyes open because once your eyes are opened, <laughs> then you keep looking, right? right. But you have to get to that point. And so it's going to be a long time, you know, but it takes people like you and I to just keep spreading the message and giving people hope. Yeah. Because once you discover this stuff, you're like, why does everybody not know about this? And it's like, <laughs> before it was on my soapbox and now I guess my soapbox is, is the is the podcast, but I literally want, I just want people to know about it and be like, oh, wait, there's another way because I had no clue. And I consider myself educated smart person. And I didn't even look to see what was going on in my own body. I completely was so disconnected from my body. It was just, and it took me years to even, because most people I'm coaching are like the type A busy professional and like the spiritual side of things, like they're into the tests and the and the the diet and when we we nail into that but the spiritual side of things that takes a while for people to even know that there's there's something to look in there to really trust yourself to not you know beat out your intuition that you you know you know your body best right i think that you represent most women i mean that's how most of us are unfortunately Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so at what point, uh, knowing what you know now, would you refer someone to the fertility clinic? How long should we really focus on our preconception health? Um, that's kind of my last resort at this point. I rarely send people to the REI office or the endocrinologist, at least around here, because what I have found is they are quick to do the procedure or give the pill. And I want to spend time with them revamping their diet changing their lifestyle, really looking at what, how are they dealing with their emotions and their baggage and all their relationship stuff? You know, what is holding them back from getting healthy? And you work on that, you will get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard because it's sometimes I feel like I'm fighting people off from going to the clinic and they're in like this panic that they're, they've got to go over here for it to work. And, you know, I'll just mm -hmm. give them a little bit of time to work on some of this stuff. And but really feeling like that guarantee is the clinic, but yeah. You know, and that's their right. If they, that's, right. that's what they want to do, then, you know, I'll be here if it doesn't work. That's mm -hmm. what I say. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, let's go into a few questions here about, okay, what's your take on the birth control pill and, and how it impacts um, hormones and fertility? Yeah, that's a, a controversial one as well, because it's used for everything in conventional gynecology. Yeah. It's supposed to, you know, regulate your cycles, fix your cycles, fix your hormones, make you feel better. It's not doing that. It's shutting down your hormone system. It's overriding it with synthetic hormones. And so it may look like you're having a regular cycle, but you're really just having a withdrawal period from these synthetic hormones that you're taking. And we are now understanding that that is not the healthiest situation, especially for our young girls um, trying that haven't had children before because it disrupts our gut microbiome, it disrupts our gut lining, you know, it can shut off our ovary, our HPO axis or hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis for good. You know, some women will do the pill, the pill for 10 years, they'll come off and they won't have periods because that communication has been shut down for so long. Your body's like, what? What's the problem? You didn't want us to talk. We don't talk, right? And so that can be really hard just to restart that access, you know, from communicating. So I think that medicine thought it was the end all be all greatest thing. It was more than just birth control. It was, you know, 
giving women their freedom. Then you didn't, then they whole started the, oh, you don't have to have a period more than three or four times a year. And they mm -hmm. tried to, you know, give you these prolonged pills and that caused more breakthrough bleeding and more depression and weight gain and issues. But the idea was you're just not on the right one. You just need to keep trying. We just need to monkey with it some more. And there. so there's yeah. like over a hundred different types of birth control pills out there. You know, all these different formulations of this estrogen and progestin that there's supposed to be one that works for you is the idea. And really it's, it's a bunch of garbage. I mean, honestly, we need to use it for what it is. It's to prevent pregnancy. I, as a professional woman, am very grateful for that because if I would have had a second child after my first baby in high school, I probably would not have been able to succeed and do everything I've done. But I should have been aware of the risks of taking the pill, right? And the possible long-term consequences, but I wasn't. So I think it comes back down to education and just awareness again. Yeah. When one of the side effects is stroke or death, like why is that a option to help someone who's got acne. <laughs> right, right. But it's completely acceptable. Mm -hmm. And then you're when I recommend you stop eating dairy to get rid of your acne, I'm looked at like I'm crazy. You know, I like, can't give up cheese. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, it's and and I had Dr. Jolene Brighton on, so we have a good episode about that talking about um, yeah. Yeah, the, her, her book, Beyond the Pill, so post-birth control pill syndrome. And, and I see a lot of people, so like myself, so I was put on the pill in my early 20s when my cycles were very irregular. And then when I came off, for me, it was POF. And then I was also then put on it for 10 more years after that, after I had my kids. Like that's the food sensitivities, the gut infections, all, all of that like, predisposes you to that. And we see a lot of people that have been on in the pill not to say everyone that goes on the pill is then going to be experiencing infertility, but the people that I'm speaking to typically didn't go on it for prevention. They went on it for, like you're saying, like the irregular periods, the heavy periods, something was going on with their cycle and it's just a band-aid approach. And then now on the other end, now they're dealing with, they can't get pregnant. Exactly. I mean, I just had a nurse practitioner ask me yesterday about a patient who's 36 years old. She's kind of an uncommon situation. She's 36. She's not sexually active. She doesn't plan to be or have any children. She's been having heavy periods for six months. And so the approach was, should I just start her on birth control pills or should I get an ultrasound first? And I'm like, she's not sexually active. Like birth control pills are not the answer, you know? I mean, you can offer that to her, but you need to have an honest discussion. Like this is not really what they're for. We use it for this because it's a good bandaid and it will lighten up your periods, but it's not going to get to the root cause of why you have estrogen excess, which is most likely your obesity and your stressed out lifestyle and your poor diet, right? So that's where I still struggle is because, you know, trying to work with my conventional colleagues on things and them not understanding this, it's just like, okay, time to educate some more, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the conventional side where it's a pill for, for, for an ill. For yeah, instance. yeah, yeah, absolutely. because it's a quick, easy fix, but then you're just adding 10 new problems and yeah. it guarantees that you're always going to have a patient come into your office, right? True. True. I don't yeah. think that's the intent. I think no. most people become physicians because they care and they mm -hmm. do want to help people. But I think there's something deeper within the medical system that keeps people sick and really drives that, you know, big pharma issue. Say big pharma. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and what's your take on someone who hasn't had a period in a year? Is that is that full menopause in a year, or like obviously, obviously there's a menorrhea, but. Like, what's your take on with low AMH, high FSH, no period for a year? Well, it depends on their age. If they're over 45, I'm less likely to, you know, think about anything other than just menopause. But if it came out of the blue, that's a little weird. If they're younger than that, you need to start investigating as to what's going on because it's often reversible. You know, if you listen to Dr. Anna Kabeka, she reversed mm -hmm. her premature ovarian failure and went on to have a baby. Like, I know. I'm hoping you're on the podcast in a couple weeks. Yeah, <laughs> it's totally doable. So I think that we have this mentality, at least in the United States, that having a period is a big inconvenience and I don't really want it. So I get a lot of patients who are like, 
like, I can't wait to be done with this and be in menopause. I'm like, you are asking for the wrong thing. I promise you, you know, that will aid you in so many ways. And you should want to have a healthy period. That is an indicator. It's a vital sign of your good health and functioning body. And so we just need to change the dynamic around how we think about periods and how we train our daughters to think about it. I get so many moms bringing in their teenage daughters for birth control pills because they want to stop the period. They're in sports and they don't want to have the period. I'm like, how about we optimize the period so that you know when it's coming and it's not heavy and crazy and painful and you can manage it because in the long term, it's going to be so much healthier for you. But that takes a lot of educating. It takes a lot of time to talk about you know, eating processed foods and sugar and all of those things. So teenagers traditionally have just wanted to hop on the pill and I get it. It's an option, but it's not my first go-to like it was 10 years ago. Yeah. This is my daughter who's almost 19. And uh, anyways, it's interesting kind of, I'm like, I'm over here talking all this natural side of things and functional things. And then, you know, she has to make her own decisions and goes on the pill. And I'm, and it was interesting because I'm like, she, I can't control what she's going to do, but I'm just like sending her articles. I'm like, here you go. Here you go. She's like, okay, I'm going off. But it's, um, you know, she had acne, but she, you know, she's done a lot of uh, diet and lifestyle changes too for that. So it's, there's just so much yeah. pressure of, even yeah. though she knows all this stuff, like she's known the diet peace for years and years, but so much pressure, you know, she goes off to university and everyone's like, you better go on the pill. Like she had a doctor literally yelling at her. Like, mm -hmm. why are you going off the pill? I'm like, you yeah. don't let anybody talk to you that way. Exactly. I think that's really common, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As like a young woman and you've got someone in a position of authority, like, you know, you know, trying to make you feel less than it was just like horrible. Just back, just back to the period side of things. So if it's been, so you believe, um, so the period hasn't been for two or three years and they're under 45, there's still things we can do to, to, to reverse. Yeah. 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 I've seen it happen. And so what's your take on blood sugar and hormone balance? Oh my goodness. So important, you know, especially if you have a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome, because really that's a metabolic syndrome, a metabolic issue of insulin resistance, and you're on your way to getting diabetes. But even if you don't have that diagnosis, cortisol and insulin and blood sugar play such a major role in those downstream sex hormones. So I like to say that sex hormones are just innocent bystanders. They're like just hanging out doing their thing. And the big dogs, cortisol, insulin, thyroid, when they get messed up, they affect the sex hormones. You know, they're just trying to survive. And so if your blood sugar is constantly elevated and you're constantly having to push up more insulin to bring up that blood sugar and take it into the cells, you're causing all kinds of inflammation and free radical stress on your system. You are damaging things at the cellular level. I mean, we need to think about the fact that our body, all of these functions are microscopic cellular level functions. They're not like just because your uterus and ovaries are big organs that you see, your fertility is microscopic that you don't see. And you need to make sure that the the cells are not inflamed and that they're functioning well, right? So it really does make a difference if you have this chronic inflammation going on. So I like to tell women, cortisol, your stress hormone, every time you get stressed and you pump out cortisol, your body thinks you're either going to get in a fight or run away. And so it has to make sugar from your liver and pump it out into your bloodstream. And then you have to make insulin to go take care of it. And you just get on this vicious cycle of you know, your blood sugar going in and out and your pancreas working overtime. And it's just a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those those hangry, the irritability, the sweating, like all, all that stuff with the blood sugar popping all over the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you can't convert your thyroid hormone into active thyroid hormone. You're converting it way too much into reverse T3, which okay. is kind of like a bully. It's inactive and it'll sit on those receptors on all your millions of cells and block 
active T3 from giving the signals like, hey, boost your metabolism. Hey, do this. You know, it's like a big bully. And as long as you keep having insulin resistance and blood sugar issues and chronic cortisol production, your thyroid's not going to function well either. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And what about vitamin D? We've talked about this one. I've done a whole podcast on this, but, but <laughs> yeah, we see this all the time with vitamin D in the single digits or double digits. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, it's good to supplement, but then, well, why is it off to begin with? Right. And I think, you know, you're up in Canada. I'm up in Michigan. It's super common for us to be in the low double digits, you know, 10, 19. Yeah. I mean, that's just really low. And honestly, vitamin D is a pro hormone. It's not really a vitamin. And so it's needed for hormone conversion, right? So if our levels are super low, our hormones aren't going to be able to do what they need to do. And Nowadays, we slather on sunscreen for the two months that we actually do see the sun. You know, it's been 90s in the 90s up here in yeah, Michigan, sure. but everybody's covered in sunscreen. So they're not even making their own vitamin D. I honestly have most patients on at least 5,000. I use a D3 with K2 a day mm -hmm. because that's what it takes to get them up to about 50. You know, that's where I see you being able to function in an optimal range, 50 to 70. Some people say higher, but, you know, conventional medicine says 30 is good enough. Yeah. So some literature even says 20. And I just think that, you know, we're not trying to prevent active disease. We're trying to create optimal function. You know, I'm not trying to prevent you from getting rickets. I'm trying to help you get pregnant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a huge difference. You know, the recommended daily allowance of vitamins and minerals is the bare minimum that's going to prevent you from getting an active disease. Do you want to live at that level or do you want to like function optimally, right? Absolutely. I know. I think, well, the, the, I think the functional range is 60 to 80, but yeah, it's interesting how many people we see it so low. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it totally changes your insulin resistance and it's associated with fibroids and endometriosis. There was, there's studies out there showing that IVF has a 35% success improvement rate when your vitamin D level is optimized. Like, mm -hmm. how can you? ignore that crazy and so what about your take on sometimes with the with the conventional side of things again that's that band-aid approach and just you know, instead of looking at the whole body it's attacking the hormones so looking at um bioidentical hormones typically with low amh or pof or poi or dor it's the recommendation will be supplementing with DHEA and also for other ones, supplementing with progesterone. So what's your take on, on that? Well, I think that sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes you need to support those downstream systems when you're working on the upstream systems, right? So that women can feel better and get an easy win while they're doing the hard work. I think where people go wrong is they think the bioidentical hormone is the answer to everything and then they still don't feel well or they feel well for like six months and then they go back to how they were because it was just a band-aid. And so I think it's super important to do the diet and lifestyle. Like I sound like a broken record, but it's so true. Like you can take the supplement, but your body's still gonna steal it if you're, you know, trying to make too much cortisol or you can take the thyroid hormone and if your cells and receptors can't even bind to it and hear the signal, it's not really going to matter. Like it's the same thing with um, sex hormones, with your progesterone and estrogen. So if you have like premature ovarian failure and you've literally healed your gut, you've done the emotional work, you're like, got your priorities straight, you're eating a low inflammatory diet, and your ovaries still aren't back online. Yeah, I would say I personally would take bioidentical hormones because you're going to age prematurely. You know, if you're in your 30s, 
You don't want your bones to start thinning all of a sudden. You don't want your heart health to go down, your brain, you know, start having brain fog and thin skin and vaginal health. Don't even get me started on that. That's a whole nother podcast. Um, So I think there is definitely a time and a place. And it also matters what type you're using. So you want to make sure you're using a natural progesterone that isn't going to, you know, increase your risk of blood clot and stroke. And I would much rather use the transdermal approach for estradiol so that you're not converting so much of it to estrone, which is a more concerning estrogen metabolite. So, you know, there's details inside of that that uh, require discussion for each individual. Mm-hmm, absolutely. I've got a qu- couple of quick, um, well, not quick, but the, I'll try to make them quick, uh, mm-hmm. audience questions here. So one is about uh, early ovulation. So um, ovulating before cycle day 10, what's your take on that one? Yeah. So maybe your estrogen's too high and your antral follicles are maturing too quickly. Um, I would go back to the basics of trying to optimize your diet and lifestyle and see if you can get your stress dialed in. And, you know, I don't see that very often. I'll be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause it could be, yeah, as I say, the stress or there could be hypothyroid is- issues, but yeah, the stress, mm-hmm. the diet, and yeah, there may be estrogen dominance perhaps potentially there too. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And then another question on increasing chances of pregnancy with diminished ovarian res- uh, reserve in the early 40s. We've kind of talked some, about some of that. What's your specific take on that? Yeah. So we know that your chances go down significantly. And I would love to see like what your levels look like, your anti-malarian hormone, FSH, estradiol levels on day three, that type of thing so that we can see, do we just need to maximize what you got going on? Or are we at a point where we're looking at premature ovarian failure? I say if you're still having cycles every month that you should really try and work on that because I think there's hope for you. And what about, so what's a success story you'd like to share with us? Anything coming to mind? Oh my gosh, I just had a, a woman last month. She came to me Earlier in the year, she was typical PCOS, overweight, having a couple periods a year, and she had done Clomid, I think four times, like four months in a row with no um, success. And she's like, okay, what do I need to do? We need to figure this out. And honestly, I made her do the elimination diet with my nutritionist. Mm -hmm. So we really decreased her inflammation significantly. She had subclinical hypothyroidism with a Hashimoto's picture. Her EPO antibodies, I think, were 300 or something like that. And so I said, you know, you need to stay away from gluten and dairy long term. And she she ended up doing a food sensitivity test um, and realized that she was eating some healthy food that were also contributing to her inflammation. So I said, let's remove those for a good six months, let your immune system calm down. Maybe you can add it back in once your immune system's calmed down and your gut's healed and everything. But Then I added some Vitex or Chase Tree Mm -hmm. to her and like literally two months later, she was pregnant Mm -hmm. and she had lost 30 pounds within that time period. She had so much energy. I mean, I did some vitamins and other things as well, but just decreasing that systemic inflammation, I think was key for her to like be able, because when you think about fallopian tubes, it has millions of little villi inside of them, like little finger-like projections that have to grab the egg and sweep it down through the tube. And then the sperm has to meet it. And once that embryo's developed, those villi have to function and get it down into the uterus. And so many things will damage those villi, just like the villi in our intestinal lining that helps sweep food and nutrients and things like that. And so we know that smoking destroys those villi in the fallopian tubes and chronic inflammation. And so getting that to function better, I imagine makes the sperm able to get up there, meet the egg, and then have that egg actually get to the uterus and implant. So it's back to that microscopic stuff, but 
I mean, she healed herself just by revamping her diet. Yeah, I love it. We see it all the time. I love it. I love it. Yes. And so you have a free download for our listeners. Uh, so it's a functional gynecologist guide to, ba- to balancing hormones. And I'll have the, the link in the show notes. But what can they expect in that uh, guide? So we talk about your gut health and your liver function. The liver is a major detox you know, center for our system, for our hormones, our our estrogen metabolites, especially. So I talk about how to optimize function of that and how to balance your stress to decrease your cortisol production and all good tidbits like that. So lots of usable daily tips that you can incorporate to really change how your body's functioning. So definitely go to the show notes and grab your free download of the Functional Gynecologist Guide to Balancing Your yeah. Hormones. Yeah. And thanks so much, Dr. Tabitha, for coming on. This is like, I, I just love this conversation. And thanks for all the work that you're doing uh, and to, you know, to, to further the message around this and really to empower women. Thank you so much for having me and keep up your good work. You're doing awesome. Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend blue blocks, blue and green light sleep classes to all our one-to-one clients. Simply go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get pregnant podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code getpregnantpodcast. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we wanna help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers, really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on book a free call. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you are a U.S. resident, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E to 55444. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20 minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to our heart. These simple yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. For U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E to 55444. For non-U.S. residents, go to Yoga Freebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E to access your special gift. That's yogafreebie.com to access the free fertility yoga download. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.